stream will begin momentarily. Thank you all for joining us. We're gonna let everyone get their seats, get their popcorn and soda pops while we do some soldering and more flipper rebuilding today, which I'm really excited about. I got some flippers I need to rebuild too. This is a big help. If anyone is joining in now and on the chat, let us know how our audio sounds, you know, because we want to sound beautiful for you. Yeah, for, the, for the first time in eight, nine streams. Oh, this is our eighth stream. Our yeah. tests always go great. <laughs> yeah, the tests are flawless, but everything else, well, yeah. So how is Kyle's level sounding? Um, uh, give me a, give us a thumbs up or say something in the chat. Kyle, uh, talk a little bit. What game are we working on? Kyle could be a little louder. I could be louder. Okay, I will continue talking at the same level. And we're working on Lady Luck. Oh yeah, I want to make you louder. Lady That's Luck. weird. I changed that. Okay, keep talking for me, Kyle. Uh, okay. We are still going to be working on Lady Luck, and this thing's going to be real sweet pretty soon. I'm excited uh, Excited to play it more. It's a great game. It's got cool art. It is my goal to have all of the fake Nagel pinball art games, and I think I've got both of them. Is there any more? Probably. Diamond Lady? I don't remember what the art on that Gottlieb game was. A lot of background noise on Kyle? No. Um, oh, let me put that noise filter back on. Yeah, just in case it starts dumping a tropical st uh, storm in 20 minutes. Yes, it is supposed to be raining soon, which will make things a little interesting for us. Oh, nope, the I'll push all right, how's he sounding now? Keep talking for us, Kyle. Background noise. Down my trench, I'll leave. That noise gate thing I just put back on is really messing with your audio. Keep talking. Maybe you put the noise gate on too high. I thought this was supposed to be a, a audio issue free stream. Well, I did two tests and you sounded great and uh, No, no. Now we're saying you're not sounding great, but Okay, keep talking. I'm gonna keep using my voice. Um I'm excited to solder on camera. This will be a lot of pressure. I've never felt like uh, I would have to have fun when I'm soldering before. Um, tripping on a chair. All right. Well, sounds like we got the go ahead. So we're going to just go ahead and jump right into it. I oh, no. I little logo thing, but are you ready? Are you, uh, I guess I'm readier than ever. Is Kyle presentable? Let's see. <laughs> Am I presentable? Two, one. I mean, everything other than my hair. Oh, he's fixing his hair. Ah. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode eight of Pin Tech Live. And I'm super excited because if you see right in front of us, Kyle's going to show us how to solder. Mm. And I feel like soldering is the scariest or at least the most, one of the most intimidating parts about pinball. So Kyle's going to cool down our nerves, heat up the soldering iron and then yeah. we're gonna finish these flippers soldering how, how are you doing Kyle? uh you know the the pre-stream jitters are finally leaving my body now that we're live um soldering is not really hard um and it's not really difficult to do it well but it is totally something you want to practice till you get that like oh moment when everything kind of comes together and you're like oh that's how you do it <laughs> um right I've got some uh, some pretty basic tools. Um, 
I have a bench set up usually um, where I have like a dedicated bench soldering iron that I'll work on things on the bench with. This is my uh, traveling, if you want to make the big cam on the Sony here. Oh, yeah, absolutely, I sure do. Uh, this is like my traveling soldering iron, just something small that fits in my toolbox. Um, it has adjustable temperatures, but I never really adjust it. I think this is a 67 watt soldering iron. People always ask, it's like, well, don't I need a solder? No, no, you just need a soldering iron that gets hot. I think like a 25, 20 watt soldering iron is like totally acceptable for pinball. Uh, sometimes you want a really high wattage soldering iron so you could get these things, you know, they get hot and it's uh, easier to melt and work on fatter wires or big lugs, but just work with what you have. And then when you realize it's not right, upgrade. Um, so yeah, other tools we will be using that are pretty, uh, that I like to use. This uh, brass brush uh, that mm, I use to clean the brush. tip. What'd you say? Toothbrush. Yeah. Right? like a toothbrush for people that want to rip all the enamel off their teeth. This will help me clean the tip. Um, a lot of soldering irons will have like a brass sponge that you can clean the tip with, but since I don't carry a brass sponge with me, this is a good job way of getting uh, crud off the tip. I've got some diagonal cutters. Diagonal cutters are like your best friend when doing anything pinball. They're cheap, they're disposable, they last a long time. You totally want to have a good couple pairs of these. I think I've got three pairs in my toolbox, all varying degrees of sharpness. That's the important part. Um, of sharpness, not size? Not it's size, sharpness. but it's just like when you start cutting like really fat wires or you start cutting things that are not wire, which is what these are designed to cut, <laughs> they get dull. So I keep like a really sharp pair and then a kind of sharp pair and then like the garbage pair you just try to cut anything with. Okay. And then I've got a uh, set of wire strippers. Everyone needs a good set of wire strippers. Um, so a couple of basics with soldering. Um, the solder is going to flow anywhere that's hot, um, and it will also flow to anything that has flux on it. Going to be have flux inside of it which is just, it's something that helps the solder melt and to flow. Um, the first thing I'll generally do when I start to solder is to clean the tip. So what I'll do is I'll take my solder and I will apply it to the tip of the iron just to kind of get it pulled up. Um, you can flick it off, but this is what this brush comes into play for. Is I could come in here and just gently brush and get all the impurities and the dirt and the nastiness off of the tip. That will help soldering go a lot smoother for you. Basically, nice. what you're doing when you're soldering is you are using molten metal to get two metal things to stick together. Pretty simple. Um, your best. Uh, Let's just get into it, and then we can go over some kind of like best practices or what we're doing. So what you just did with the tip was you're just prepping the tip, right? Yeah. It's kind of cleaning it off. I cleaned it. Now you can see if the camera focuses, it's very shiny. Before it had a bunch of like black dots on it that's yeah. either old dirty solder or coil dust or something, and that will create crummy solder joints. Um, it's good to have a clean tip when you're doing this kind of stuff. Again, this is not you know, this is not aerospace precision, this is not medical device precision. Like, a good solder job will be enough. You don't need to go through, you know, hours and hours of training to do this stuff, but to get it right and to feel confident doing it just is a lot of practice. And I'd recommend, you know, I was teaching one of my coworkers the other day on this bummer coil with just some big fat wire, how to lay in a solder joint. Um, you could just sit here over and over and over again and practice, practice, practice. And in fact, let's do that on this thing first. Yeah, I, uh, um, yeah, I could show you a really bad soldering joint if I had a shot of my hard body uh, from my first attempt soldering. It's yeah. not working too well, so I have to redo it. But Kyle, one thing I noticed, um, you're a professional solderer, if that's even a title. But yeah, I guess. For us that are just starting off, you, what about like gloves and eyewear, you know? Um, that thing gets hot, right? 
It gets hot. Okay, yeah, so let's go back and let's go over a couple safety things first. <laughs> this stuff gets Take hot. Gloves. When you are soldering and you are getting this, you know, the, the one thing you'll do, the most important part of soldering, right, is to get both things you want to join hot and then add the solder, and that holds it together. If you do not get both things hot and add the solder, it creates what you hear is like a cold solder joint, and those are very weak. Uh, so what, you know, if you don't have like really callous fingers, you're going to want something to hold the hot stuff with. So um, I sometimes will just use my needle nose pliers to hold things while I'm heating them up so I don't burn the heck out of my fingertips. Um, Sometimes, you know, people have those like third hands, which have like those little clips and a little magnifying glass. Those are great too. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing is do not breathe in the smoke. That's really important. Um, having good ventilation is important. Um, again, when I'm doing this and I've got my head inside of a pinball game, just breathe away, hold your breath, try not to inhale it. It's not good for you. Um, Can I also, use more like an N95 mask or something? I'm not sure. Or, I don't think that would really, on. I'm not sure if that would filter out any of the bad stuff, but just don't actively, you know, breathe in this cloud of smoke that happens when you solder. It's, you'll be safe. I've lived I long just, enough doing that and, uh, you know, that's my precaution. Just don't breathe it in. Well ventilated area is definitely important though. Um, the other thing is uh, wash your hands after you touch this stuff. Even though this might not be lead solder anymore, this 40-year-old Bally coil absolutely, most likely, has leaded solder on it, and that is uh, a good way to poison yourself, and that might end in death. And you don't want that, because then you won't be able to play pinball anymore. Um, what, what, type of, what type of soldering uh, solder do I use? Because I see there's like 60-40 and, you know, other numbers and stuff I don't quite get. When I'm soldering these coils, what exact solder should I get? And thickness as well, too, because there's so many different thicknesses. good pool and a good connection, but you know, it's versatile enough to work on boards. So I don't need to carry two or three different spools of solder around. Again, my experience being a field tech, I try to keep everything in two or three boxes. And if I had to bring my bench worth of soldering equipment, I'd need, you know, a truck, a big truck to carry all this stuff around. So find what you like. Personally, I've been, I like the 20 gauge solder. This is a two and a half percent flux or something like that. So it's a I don't necessarily need to have my bottle of flux and a toothbrush. Um, it, it's pretty well-rounded. 60-40, that's a good place to go. Um, okay. See what works best okay. for you. I mean, when you get good at it, you'll notice it's like, oh, I like this more than the other one. If you were using a big fat gauge solder, you might not find it suitable to work on boards, or you'll add just a teeny bit of solder and it'll be a big pool. Um, yeah. The one thing that someone told me that was my best advice when it came, after I learned how to solder, it's like, oh, this is how you make an okay joint, is just is make it look factory, right? You look at something and it's like, oh, that looks really nice. And then if you're done and you've got this mountain of blobbish solder and there's like peaks and it looks weird, you know, it's not gonna leave the factory looking like that. If it looks nice and smooth and it looks like, you know, a machine did it, then you know you've done a pretty decent job. So that's what you can aspire to. Uh, I'm not a master solderer. I do solder things on pinball games, but that is, you know, <laughs> that is my level of expertise. Um, so, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of things I could learn. So this is not like a total end-all, be-all tutorial. We had a, a few comments in the chat. Um, one of these was a suggestion from MGM Studios, having like a little small desk fan. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great way to keep it out of your face. Um, yeah. Again, it just do not breathe this in. It's not good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone says we, we want you to live a long time, Kyle. Oh, so great. Don't breathe it in. <laughs> that was from Tattooing Sky. And hello, everybody. Uh, Jeff Rensby is from Canada watching us. And we have some sound stuff going on, but we're just going to ignore that. That it didn't happen. All right. He's cleaning off his kit. Yeah, we'll get this thing Fresh all nice and shiny again. 
So what I'm going to do here with this, this is kind of an obnoxious solder blob, but let's just use this as an example. It's like, let's remove a wire from a coil, okay? So, like I said, flux helps solder melt. Um, let me see if I could zoom in on this a little bit better and see if it focuses. Um, what we want to do is, in this position generally, I could say, this is fresh solder, but if we were working again with this 40-year-old, see how this solder on this coil is kind of dull? But this solder on this coil is very shiny. This is fresh solder. Um, it's going to melt really quick. So what I'll generally do, if this wasn't fresh solder, add a tiny bit of solder to the tip of the soldering iron, mm -hmm. and then heat it up. And you're waiting for the heat to disperse and melt, and you'll be able to pull this stuff away. Um, if I didn't add solder to this uh, to the tip before I did that, it might take a little while longer to melt off. But that's that flux helping the solder, you know, spread out and heat up, uh, melt. Um, the uh, sorry, I'm trying to collect my thoughts and figure out the best way to <laughs> teach the rest of this. The one important thing that a lot of people need to learn how to do, we're going to solder a coil to a coil, just because I like using this smaller gauge wire more. One thing people need, uh, a good tip, is to tin a wire. So when you hear tinning a wire, what you're going to do is you're going to get the solder to impregnate the strands of copper that make up the wire, and that will help create a nice solid joint. So to tin a wire, you're going to have your exposed end here. Let me get that in the shot. And we are going to, uh, sorry, trying to get that in the middle. Again, to tin the wire, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a little bit of solder to the tip. We're going to hold and make uh, the largest point of surface uh, to surface contact with the tip as we can. So you don't wanna just hold the edge of the wire, uh, tip of the soldering iron under the wire. You're not gonna transfer a lot of heat. Hold the biggest, fattest side up against the wire, and then apply the solder to the wire. And then you'll watch it suck itself in, melt in, and you're going to have a very shiny wire. Um, you want to make sure you apply the solder to what you are trying to join or what you're trying to tin. Instead of applying it to the tip and then allowing it to flow in here, um, you could get a situation where the wire might not be hot enough to accept all of the solder. Again, you're trying to join two things with melted metal. You want both things to be hot so it sticks to those surfaces. Um, so now we've got a tinned wire. We can uh, tin one of the lugs of this old coil here. If the, um, if the solder impregnates the wire, does it have to provide wire support? Does it have to I don't know how to answer that question. So provide wire support. It does, like, you know, if you impregnate, if the wire gets too co coated in solder, it does become very stiff. You could heat this wire up so hot that the solder will start going in behind the insulation. It'll also start bubbling up and melting this insulation, and that's not ideal. Um, so just, again, what you're looking for when you're doing this is to heat it up and watch the solder disperse into that wire. Um, once you see it, you know, kind of melt in there, you know you're good. Nice. Um, what's up with your, what, is that the name of the brand, Black Beast Coil? <laughs> yeah, this is the, these are the coils that were in, like, old Data East and Sega games. Wow. The Black Beast. Oh, it was a joke. I don't understand soldering jokes, y'all. Yeah, you <laughs> confused me. I'm, I'm, I turned off my comedic <laughs> mode and I turned on my uh, <laughs> trying to teach mode. Um, another tool, um, it's too zoomed in to show, I've got a solder sucker. These are handy. Um, they allow you to evacuate solder from things. Um, and just for an lug, get the solder to melt, and then Ooh. suck it off. I did that poorly. I'll do it from this side so it's not moving around on my handshake. It's a paternity joke. Oh my gosh. <laughs> You're killing me. You're killing me. Oh, we're just seeing your hand. Okay. So now we've got, you can kind of see the, uh, the eyelet in the coil now. Um, it's not just a giant solder blob. Oh, okay. So in this nice. case, I'm going to try soldering it with it up and down so you can kind of see it better. What I'll do in this case generally is, you know, again, we're going to get our, the tip of the soldering iron with a little solder on it. We're going to heat up the lug 
and then apply the solder to the lug, add a little bit there. A little bit of solder, um, fresh solder will help these things, you know, they'll melt together a lot easier. So now what we can do, this is all very basic, and again, it's like, this is something you just need to practice. Um, it, you, the best results will come from someone who practices this. And the best tip is don't practice on your pinball machine. Yeah, find a junk coil, find an old piece of wire, and just, you know, try to get things to stick to each other, and then you've, get, you've done your first step, right? So now yeah. what we're going to want to do is we want to try to get... Like I said, we want to try to heat both of the surfaces that are going to be, uh, you know, melded together. Let's see if I can do it sitting down. This is where everyone that solders always says they need three hands, and it's totally true. Um, can we do you see ever them? use, like, an assistant to help you solder? Uh, yeah, sometimes I have, like, you know, again, those little clips that are on a wire base. Those are really handy. Oh, but okay. not a second person, usually. So what I'm going to try to do here is we're going to apply the soldering iron tip to uh, three different things. We're going to apply heat to the coil lug, we are going to apply heat to the wire, and then we are going to add some solder. Now then, th we're, again, we're not trying to make a gigantic pool and encapsulate both of these things solidly in solder. That's not going to create a good joint. Uh, so what we're going to do is, again, we'll just try to, we'll fill it out and we'll make it look like a smooth, nice surface. I'll show you what that means once we're done. Uh, so we'll get the soldering iron on the lug, on the wire, and again, we're going to try to apply the solder to the things we're trying to join, not the tip of the iron. Something like that. This is not ideal. This is a, since I'm not holding it and it's all, everything's moving, but... Oh, so I was under the impression that the hole that is there in the coil, like I was supposed to stick the wire in there and like fold it over so it's like you attached can. to that hole. I, I, I go both ways on that. Sometimes I like doing that because it, it, it holds the wire in place and that's when I don't need that third hand, right? But at the same time, I also get angry at myself when I do that because when I need to take the coil off or something like that, it's a lot harder to pull the wire out of that oh, hole sure. in the lug. So um, I don't, and personally, I don't think there's a right and a wrong way. Everyone has their preference. You do you. Oh, yeah. Ned Reamer just said the same thing. He avoids mechanical connection when soldering, meaning he does, don't wrap the wire because it's easier yep. to fix it. I think that's... That's like an operator's thing too, right? Like I'm going to solder my flipper rebuild and I'm not going to touch it again for a while, but... Yeah, but it's that, that is good You're because again, if you that, right? if you make a good mechanical connection, it could mask a poor solder connection. So that is a really mm -hmm. that is a good point. I like that tip. Thank you, Net Reamer. So I'm gonna zoom in here, and again, this isn't like the world's best, most perfect soldering mm -hmm. job, but you can see that uh, here it's having trouble focusing. <laughs> too close, too close. You've got this bit where it's it's kind of it's just it's a smooth nice wave. There's no globs, okay. there's no blobs, there's not a ton of solder. You know, you might look at that and be like, oh, that's not enough solder. How's that ever going to hold? But I mean, it's really on there. <laughs> so yeah. sometimes, I guess another tip, less is more. Don't, don't go blobbing it on. Um, that you have to really get a good feel for. There's only so much, um, you know, sit down instruction you can get. It's best just to dive right in and practice on something that's not super valuable. Um, now let's try to do something on this old coil here. We've got this old solder, it's not fresh, it might be grumpy and not want to unsolder itself from the lug. So in this case, again, now you can see here just after soldering a bit, you see how dirty the tip of the soldering mm -hmm. iron is? So you want to clean that again? Um, if I was working on a board, I would definitely want to clean it, but in this case, let's just practice good tip maintenance. Thank you, everyone, for really, you know, diving in in the chat. We're getting so many great 
uh, tips on soldering in here. So I'm awesome. glad we have it up on the screen too because it's a great reference for later. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. I'm excited to read some of it because again, I, I like watching other people solder to see the ways that other people do things. Yeah. It's you always learn something new. I'm just not trying not to interrupt Kyle. He's on a roll right now. <laughs> I want but you I to interrupt you. because I you. I'm having trouble like putting all of this into words. This is something I just kind of turn my brain off and do. So it's kind of hard for me to, you know, <laughs> trying to make a, a good lesson here. But in this case, we've got, um, let me zoom in a teeny bit again. We've got this coil here that has old solder on it. And it is going, generally it's way easier to get this stuff to melt um, when you add a little bit of fresh solder to the tip. A little bit of flux in there always helps. And let that, that came off really easy actually. <laughs> I was hoping it would be annoying. But... That's, that's, again, another pro tip. You know, instead of cutting wires, you could always desolder them. Um, it's really easy. Let's see if I can get this back in. We're going to apply a little bit of good, fresh solder. Apply heat. And there it goes. The surface area is a big thing. A lot of beginners I see are trying to do this like a surgical instrument. And they're, they're tapping down. Um, yeah, soldering irons all have, uh, <laughs> there's millions of tips, I'm sure. <laughs> for this, for I like the tip on, I don't remember what this number is. This is a Hakko soldering iron. But this it's tip is kind of, um, it comes into a chisel point, and it's maybe a millimeter wide. Um, okay. If it focuses in. But it gives oh, me so a good way flat. where I could lay it down flat and connect a big surface mm -hmm. area. And then if I was soldering on like a circuit board, I could bring it up at a really uh, tall angle and just touch the, um, you know, the pads really, and you use accuracy. Uh, there's some soldering irons that are like big chisels. Some of them have just come down to like a total pencil point. Uh, you find what you like. I find that this is my favorite all around, do everything size tip, but nice. that's just me. Nice. Uh, Tatooine Sky asks, why is older solder harder to melt? And uh, we had a few responses in the chat saying it's oxidized and doesn't transfer heat well. Yep. And um, then flux helps get past the oxidized layer and the new solder builds a heat bridge to transfer the heat to the exactly. old solder. Exactly. Yeah, and that's why I get that's why I kept saying, you know, transfer yeah, a little like or add a little bit of solder to the tip. If you add a little solder to the tip, there's flux inside this solder and it helps break down that oxidized old solder. Um, the I, I think true. my what my one of my uh, friends that taught me everything I know about you know working on pinball games. He always told me that solder will solder will flow and stick to anything that's hot, shiny, and covered in flux. So if it's shiny, it's not oxidized. If it is covered in flux, uh, that want, makes the solder want to come to it. And if it's hot, that's where it's going to sit, stay, and harden. Air sort of thing. Um, it's not yeah. as important and critical with just switches and solenoid lugs. So. Yeah, with that yeah. very, very basic lesson out of the way, um, I think we should run over to the pinball game and we can work on soldering in that end of stroke switch that we left um, oh. dangling. <laughs> yeah, Nedreamer also mentioned a thing. I don't know if you mentioned it, but um, not pushing hard when soldering because if you need to push, something's wrong, but it's all about the heat, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I yeah. always feel like, yeah, I'm like trying to jab it in there, but. <laughs> I don't need to do that. No, yeah, just let the heat do the work. You know, most good tools will do the work for you. You shouldn't need to exert force or too much effort to get these things to work. Another um, question I had really quick was, you had a soldering iron that has a temperature gauge. What is like the most ideal temperature to be doing this? And can I get, you know, a, a cheaper, if I, if I get a soldering iron that is very low wattage or temperature, is that not going to work for my purposes? No, Do I not need to necessarily. Look for a specific? Not necessarily. I, I think um, I don't speak with like a ton of authority because again, I just work on pinball games. But generally, like when you want something to heat up hotter, it's because you need to heat up a larger area. Like on a circuit, some circuit boards they have really big traces or really big pads, or you're heating up a big capacitor. So using more heat, a higher temperature will allow the solder to melt on those, you know, things that dissipate heat quicker. Um, I've used like really cheap, awful soldering irons and I, you know, 
it just it, maybe it takes a little longer for you to get the desired result. This iron okay. does have adjustable temperature, and right now I have it set to 410 degrees. Um, I'm pretty certain that is in Celsius, so that is this is hot. <laughs> it's very hot. <laughs> You want to make sure that if you do have an adjustable soldering iron to, again, you want to practice because if you crank this sucker all the way up to its highest you know, point, you'll be able to melt these wires off, but at the same time, you're gonna heat the hell out of this lug and this lug is going to melt its way out of the nylon bobbin and then you have a really sad coil. So find the temperature that, that works best that. for you. There's, you know, everyone's <laughs> gonna have a different opinion on this. Um, I think on my Hakko soldering station, the, the one that I keep like on my bench, I think I have that thing set to like between 600 or 750 most of the time. Um, sometimes you want to heat things up slow. Again, if you don't want to melt a bobbin out of a coil or something like that that's compromised, it's probably better to stay on the lower side. All right. Cool. Practice, 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 practice. Yeah. All right. So as Kyle goes to set up by the pinball machine, I wanted to go ahead, I'm going to put this link, this PDF link in the chat. This is actually a really cute soldering 101 comic that Kevin Moore shared with me. And you that can see he's, awesome. he's giving us some great tips here too. So, you know, when you're ready to work on your game and need that extra solder, please come back and reference uh, this episode and that awesome uh, link. I'll have that in the show notes in the description too, so it'll be clickable. Yeah, but, I totally uh, forgot about that, but that favorite. is like a great, yeah. great, great reference. Um, it, it, the illustration is wonderful too, so. All right, Absolutely. I'm gonna move a couple cameras, move a couple lights and set up for the next few things we're gonna do. So if anyone has any questions or want to berate me on all the bad advice I just gave, let it at me now. <laughs> we're just getting more awesome, a lot of more soldering tips going. And uh, Kevin was talking about uh, several different types of fluxes, uh, three different types of rosin flux. Yes. And I, I um, like um, I like paste have different flux. Different levels of activator. Which one do you like? I like paste flux. I don't know if that's paste like flux. rosin or I, I I don't actually I don't know the technical terms of all of these things so well, but the flux mm -hmm. I and it does a really good job of for what I. Yeah, there are so many YouTube videos as well. Uh, and we're just adding one more to that awesome extensive library on how to solder. So do your research and practice. Absolutely. Yeah, I when I was starting to solder, I was intimidated by all the 50,000 different YouTube videos of how to do it. So when I saw that comic, I was like, oh, I can just sit back, relax, and see the visuals. It's just all nice there. So that was also a great thing to have. Oh. Hey, something happened with your camera. Stand by. Uh, that was weird. No, I mean, oh, is he there back, everyone? That was weird. Just all of a sudden, all the audio wiped away because, you know, it wouldn't be a Pintech live show without our audio being... <laughs> Silly. Yeah, you know. All is right, it, do we hear Kyle? Every, everything okay? I'm speaking. <laughs> Everyone was like, no, where's Kyle? Um, Are you going to move this Sony cam over as well? Oh, yeah, no, everything's already moved over. The, the green, oh, oh, I need to move green this cam. one over this way. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, we, we need a little. Give us you a little don't want to see the back of my legs. Yeah, slight technical difficulties. We're, we're going to the pinball machine and explain where we are in this process too, because we touched this last week and um, that was long enough for me to forget where <laughs> we are. Okay, so last week we stopped at, um, we got 
Can you switch Thank to the blue you. one on the big screen so everyone yes. can see kind of where we're at? Maybe I can also adjust the camera too. We stopped last week at, um, we installed the new end of stroke switch and we found that with this aftermarket switch that was installed, the, the way that these fiber links were, were a little too long and then I modified it and it was great. And then after doing all that, we decided to um, end the stream uh, so we could do soldering this time. Um, so yeah, we've got a fully rebuilt flipper. I think I installed this crank like three times because I put it on backwards. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, now we're in a good spot. Um, the flipper is actually adjusted well with the end of stroke switch and the upper flipper actuator. So now what we're going to do mm -hmm. is just uh, reinstall all of these wires onto the new end of stroke switch. Okay, right. That's why we needed to know how to solder. Yeah, that's why we kind of took that quick little, <laughs> okay, let's do a solder but, but wait, refresher. We can't just start soldering without a little introduction on how to solder. Whew. Out of any. So this okay. kind of only works because of the height that I am. Um, I can do a lot of this work standing up and uh, using this to my advantage. This might not be the easiest way to do this. Um, I'm going to do it this way because it allows us to see better. Um, it might be best to do this work with the play field in its uh, service position. Um, generally, you don't want to solder with the play field straight up and down if you can avoid it, because if you drip, then that goes somewhere, and you sure hope oh. it's not going to be somewhere where it will short things. So That's a great tip. Um, it would be a good pro tip, and actually I will use that. I will take a rag and use that under my workspace. So if I do drip, it hopefully goes on this rag and not anywhere else. And uh, Rob Amon has a great tip about tips. Oh man, you see what I did there? <laughs> always keep that tip tinned with tip tinner. I always recommend replacing tips often, but he's usually too lazy. So tip tinner helps keep <laughs> my tips going and having solder stick to it nicely. Yeah, tip tinner is good. I, again, since I'm lazy and I mostly work out of my That's toolbox instead of at a bench, I'll use solder to tin my tip. Um, uh, no, a lot, another thing I don't particularly like is I don't like uh, sponges, like wet sponges to clean the tip of the soldering iron because I feel like- You don't that, use that. I don't like the wet sponge because it seems to take the finish off of the tip and they wear out a lot faster. Oh. That's why I kind of like that brass sponge. It kind it works well, and I replicate that with my brass brush. Um, but yeah, nice. my oh, best. And it's it's a. Uh, I heard through the grapevine that it's easy to mix up wires on this step. So let's talk about these wires and where exactly they go. Yeah. So we don't. <laughs> what we're going to want to do exactly. is again. It's really easy if you just do this one step at a time. So I remember how this was set up last time. I'm going to put my soldering iron back over the. Because edge he of the... took pictures. In my Maybe brain. Mentally, but my we my, like my to mental take camera. Physically. I remember this was the end of stroke switch, and we can remember that because it is normally closed, right? So this is what the actuator, uh, the crank, is going to break to open up the end of stroke switch. I know that this is the flipper switch for the upper flipper because it's normally open. This will close, um, you know, again, providing voltage and ground, and then it activates the upper flipper coil. So uh, do it one at a time. It's uh, really easy to lose your place if you just unsolder all of these and you're like, oh, what do I have to do now? So again, we're going to make sure I'm in the camera at all. Use a little bit of heat here, and we will unsolder this wire from the switch. We can just kind of pull it out of the way. These um, vinyl tubings, these are, not every game's gonna have these, and a lot of operators probably lost them, took them off. They're great because they um, will insulate the switch blades from each other if they ever start to bend or do anything goofy. So I'm gonna try to retain it. Um, to get this wire on, since we did flip this coil around, these wires are going to be short and they're going to be at a goofy angle. I'm going to see if this is, uh, if this will work. I think we'll be able to get this to attach okay and it won't be tight or pulling on anything. Yeah, Why be did fine. we flip the coil again? Can you explain that? that yeah. 
reasoning? Williams discovered this eventually that you'll break diodes off of flipper coils a lot less when the brunt of the vibration of the plunger hitting the coil stop is not also the same surface that the diodes are resting on. So uh, I, I like to swap them around when I can. Is it, you know, it's really not that big of a deal, but it makes me happy to do it. <laughs> so we're going to come up here and again, remember with a soldering iron, again, another very basic tip. Uh, this, you can touch. Any of this, that's a danger zone. Don't touch that. So when if you're trying to snake your way in here, you're going to melt wire, and that's bad. Um, you want to make sure that you have plenty of working room so you don't accidentally, you know, rotate a little bit and then melt through your insulation. So we're going to tin the tab of this switch, and I've made plenty of working space. I'm going to apply heat to the switch, and I am going to add a bit of solder and you don't want too much because again gravity is going to be working against us here and it's going to want to go downwards yeah all the more reason to essentially do it with the play field in the service position yeah it definitely makes it easier um, thanks for the reminder on that net reamer yeah kyle is just super og and no, I'm just that. really He's tall go. so I can access this stuff. The reason why we're doing it like this really is because of me and I want these camera angles and I wouldn't be able to get those camera angles really if it wasn't the service position. So if this game gets soldered on some other stuff it's not supposed to, I'm sorry. <laughs> you want to make sure, because again, you know, if, the, if it dripped from here, it could go here and short these two blades together. Um, oh and that, that's all bad. So you really want to you know, inspect your work, um, especially if you're not a seasoned solderist. Um, I'm going to use a tool to help get it in this position uh, so I don't burn my fingers. I'm going to take my needle nose pliers. I'm going to hold. I'm going to apply heat between the wire and the switch to get that hot. Remove the iron and try to hold this as still as possible uh, so we get a good solid joint. So heat, heat, I'm going to wait to watch it turn liquid, apply heat to both of them. It's kind of going, take it <laughs> off. You can see the insulations melting around where I have my uh, pliers. This rubberized installation really melts quick, yeah. but that's a pretty okay joint. So let's slide this vinyl tubing down over and insulate this. From the next oh, one. Oh, cool. I see how it's nice. This so one's do you a little recommend bit... people getting those insulators, especially if they're going to go ahead and do this type of soldering? Yeah, absolutely. Switches? Having, uh, having little... vinyl tubing is really handy in this, in this sort of uh, application. So here we go. Here's some really oxidized, nasty solder. And again, I could hold my soldering iron on this. Oh, well, I got it hot before. <laughs> but oh my gosh, it just came off. It took a while. Hollywood magic made it seem like it did nothing. Okay, so again, we're gonna get in here and do some similars. So sometimes you might find wires that have like a lot of oxidized solder, or especially if you're working in like a corroded area. Um, mm -hmm. If you're working on a circuit board that had battery damage and you're rebuilding a connector, sometimes these uh, wires will start to rust um, or oxidize, and that oxidation could enter the wire insulation and go back a few inches or an inch, a couple millimeters. Um, if you find that the solder does not want to go into the wire, you don't have flux handy, you can snip this, strip it, and you know use some fresher wire. Um, just a pro tip. Let's see if we nice. can. This yeah, and Net Reamer and uh, Jay Bovenzi are talking about uh, using a white towel or a towel so you can see if the parts, the solder and stuff drops into the cabinet. Yeah, so. I've got uh, I've got a very bright orange towel yeah. sitting right beneath the flipper right now. This is going to be hard. See, this is where I need like another three inches of height. But I'll just get on my tippy toes and I'll see You're if I can. You're already six, seven. Is that not enough? No. 
Oh, that reminds me. Did everyone know? That oh my gosh. <laughs> Kyle is the world's tallest pinball streamer right now, <laughs> currently. I am just the pawn. I am not the streamer. Emoto is the mastermind of all of this. World's tallest. <laughs> Sorry, Jack Danger. We got Kyle Terry right here. Jack and I are allies. We're both tall people. There's not enough of us out there, man. Hey, Captain Retro, welcome. James, welcome. Thank you. We're always updating our layout. Okay. So let's see. This one's going to be goofy because the. Guarantee that. This is further back. All I right. kind of need to be on the side the camera's on, but I can't. So we'll see if we can make this work. So you're bending. It doesn't hurt the switches to bend those connector pieces. They're not going to just like snap off. They or will if I you be... bend them too much. So it's a it's a gamble. Be careful. Great. There is a finesse to bending this kind of stuff. You just got to be gentle. I'm hoping I can't see anything I'm doing, so I'm hoping that time will. Oh All goodness. right, there we go. Hold it in place. All right, that's good enough. If any of these do become bad, I'll just have to do them where I can see them better. But for now. Again, so this is a, you know, it's not impossible. We can get this done. We've got the end of stroke switch here. Um, the end of stroke switch is now hooked up. So now when we hit the flipper button, the coil will use its low resistance, high power side to flip until the end of stroke switch is open. And that will force the uh, 40, how many volts are these flippers? 42, 40 volts, I don't remember. Uh, all 40 volts to go through the entire solenoid here, which is a high resistance, which will keep it from melting. So that's what's hooked up there. So now, this orange wire here on the other switch, this carries that voltage up to this flipper switch here, and this provides ground. So when this switch stack actuates, when this switch closes, that's the flipper switch for the upper flipper. That's how they run this system using only one switch inside the cabinet. Nice. That's why it's stacked. That's why you've got the big stack. Oh. So I'm going to, again, unsolder this switch. There it goes. I'm going to uh, dress these wires a little nicer and see if I could get this in the ideal straight up and down gooseneck position. That should work. Okay. Starting to lose the circulation in my arm, reaching up and over like this, but we got this. All right. Up and in. There aren't, uh, I think Bally ran most of their flippers this way um, that used like an upper flipper. I think the first game that did this is Captain Fantastic, but mm -hmm. Net Reamer or Bovenzi, I know those two people are in the chat. They'll probably know if I'm right or not because I've they work on those. I think Bavenzi has one, and I know Netreamer works on one all the time. But I'm pretty sure that's how Bally did all of their multiple flipper games. Um, let's see here. I'm going to get my handy dandy. Uh, where did I put them? Here they are. Needle nose okay. pliers. Nice. going to grab them. Grab it. Yeah. Oh, I failed. All right. Let me. Uh, I want to, like, grab it for him. <laughs> I could use an assistant. You just got to drive a few states over and practice social distancing while we do this. Magic Ditto had a question. For working on flippers, is there a reason, oh, you've set the play fold up all the way in the service position rather than resting it extended on the lock bar and sitting to do the work? Yeah, um, I, again, this it's mostly for camera angles, but I fault. also, I, I do this a lot because, again, I'm 6'8". And this is kind of a natural, it, it's easier for me to do this than it is for me to hunch over. So get that like that. All right, let's see if we can slip that on there. And we've got an insulator. Yeah. Those are a little tight, but it'll be okay. Um, if I was spending a little more time, I would uh, want to extend these a little bit. These aren't yeah. exerting a lot of force either direction, um, mm -hmm. but they are a little on the tight side. So it'll work, but. 
Don't so, knock me points is what I'm saying. Yeah, so it's going from the coil to those switches. Yep. What if you didn't have enough wire there? What do you do? Well, again, the reason they're so short is because I've switched the coil around with the, right. the bottom of the bobbin used to be here, and then you'd have plenty of room. If you didn't have enough room, you'd either have to uh, extend the harness or not do it at all. Oh. And again, the only reason I did it is just because it, it pleases me to be able to turn coils around like that. Can I get an, uh, the same type of like gauge wire and connect those two and then make yeah. like an extension cord? Or you could just go buy the same uh, color and gauge wire and, um, you know, just make, an ex make a longer piece instead of butting them together. Um, if you were just to emergency butt some together, um, don't use twist caps. Use heat shrink, please. Um, you okay. know, solder the wires together, put some heat shrink over it, and heat it up. Uh, you know, that's that's the most secure and uh, professional way to do that sort of stuff. If you don't have the option of uh, getting a longer piece of wire, tin this wire a little, little fresh solder. Tin the wire. No. CNK on Twitch asks, "How would I mod it to get ten points per flip?" I need all the help I can get. Uh, <laughs> Me too. How do we do that? You could adjust switches too close, so every time the flipper goes, it makes you points. Or, I guess you could wire up a 10-point switch in line with the <laughs> flipper switch, uh, <laughs> and every time you push the button, you get 10 points. Oh, That's a pro move. Nice. Yeah, I like that. All right, so we've got that hooked up. So again, let's uh, let's check for proper adjustment here. Nice, Jay Bovinci uh, confirmed that your Captain Fantastic flippers are oriented the exact same way. All right, thank you. I appreciate uh, appreciate thanks the knowledge. Yeah, thanks for searching on that. So I don't have any um, on me right now. I, I might have some in my toolbox, but I don't want to go digging for it. I should have brought this. But if you go back a few episodes when we were talking about insulating these um, end-of-stroke actuators on the crank, you want to make sure eventually to – I want to make sure I get some heat shrink to insulate this from these switches. Because at this point, when these are open, this whole thing goes live. It's only this. This nylon insulates it, but can you zoom out a little bit? I yeah, think let's I'm go back a little. Missing Sorry, missing what you're talking about. Okay. Thanks. Remember, this is voltage. This is flipper voltage here. Um, okay. If, if you just always want to make sure these things are insulated. The more I look at it, again, there's there's a there's a spacer here, so this thing is going to touch this metal switch, which is not hooked up to anything. When this okay. metal switch Get, uh, pushes on this nylon bit mm -hmm. that breaks the 40 whatever volt 42 volt connection here you just always want to be safe i always like to keep these things insulated this is what do you live. mean by insulate it what do i need to do to insulate that heat shrink tubing get some heat shrink tubing put it mm -hmm. on over this pawl and get it to okay. shrink down um okay can you switch to the the sony camera i can give an uh, example of it there's my uh, my real great uh, orange cloth that I was using for protection. But you could look at this original crank here, um, or the crank that's in there, and you see how there's that black heat shrink tubing on top of it? Oh, okay, yes. This one's naked. So uh, it just makes me happy. It's more important on the Williams games, especially on those uh, System 11 era flippers, but... Uh, it's just kind of a best practice. It, it's kind of going overboard a lot of the times, but I, I like playing it safe than sorry. So, oh, we have a our chat just blew up. So, Marco Pinball, this is a question from Arc Mecca. Do you use solder when desoldering or just heat? Uh, I use solder to desolder a lot of the time. When yeah. we were going over in the beginning, we were talking about the oxidized solder on old connections. Um, using a little that little bit of flux inside of the, your uh, fresh solder really helps the old stuff uh, loosen up. Again, you could use paste flux or something like that on a brush, and you could wipe it on there. But it's in my experience, I just like using the solder because it's cleaner. Yeah. 
So yeah. So, yeah. And uh, Net Reamer had another great tip: is it's important to hold the wire in place while the solder cools, because if it wiggles, the solder will cool to a dull finish meaning it got contaminated with air and will not hold well long term. Yes, especially on things that problem. vibrate a lot. So flippers, that's like very important to make sure you don't get those uh, bad solder connections because when this thing's, you know, flipping around and vibrating, it doesn't take much for these yeah. things to fall off. So, um, yeah, so looking at this, Thanks, I can see that we've got the end of stroke switch opening about, you know, an eighth of an inch at full travel. And I can also see that the uh, upper flipper switch is uh, closing at the full travel, so that's good. Um, I can also see when I when the thing uh, the flipper crank the thing. Let's be specific here. When the flipper crank reaches full travel, I can see that it makes contact and then over travels a teeny bit. That will ensure that we will get some upper flipper action. What I'd like to do eventually is I'll come in here and I'll adjust these things just right so we get what is called um, a little bit of swipe. And what that is is when the switch closes, they'll kind of go like this. They'll, they'll shift a teeny bit. And that will allow the switches to slightly self-clean themselves. When you get a little bit of that action, it'll wipe away a little bit of the crud and it keeps them performing a little bit better. Um, but yeah, that one's pretty good. I think we should, um, since it took us an hour to rebuild the last flipper and then modifying the end of stroke switch and, you know, taking the flipper plate off and blah, blah, blah. I think we should just roll through rebuilding the upper or this upper flipper, which is the other camera, uh, Emoto, if you want to switch to the Sony one. Oh, uh, yes, I do. Yeah, I think that's probably at an okay angle to kind of see how everything comes off again. We'll just run through it. I don't think this one's stripped out. These things are really easy to rebuild. Unlike the Williams flippers, we have to take the bases off to change the bushings. Um, so let me grab the tools and we'll just yank these things off. And uh, I want everyone to criticize me or tell me things I could do better. Or Should we time you? No, don't time me. Oh, sorry. It's not a race. Take your time. I would. I mean, that would be fun, but <laughs> let me make sure I got all my tools out. Then you could tie me. So again, we're going to start by, you want to remove the flipper. On this assembly, we've got a 1 8 inch Allen set screw inside the flipper crank. I'm going to use an Allen key. Um, like I said last time, I also have a T handle when you really need some torque, but um, well, I guess in this application I can, but in uh, doing this side, uh, you know, I won't be able to get a lot of turnage out of the T-handle since it's going to want to hit the uh, play field. So we're going to use the uh, L end of the Allen key because that will allow for the most torque to break this loose. Remember with Allen head stuff, uh, you want to make sure you get them fl flush. Like get that thing all the way in there and make sure it's bottomed out. Because if not, you could just be getting the top and you'll, you know, slip and you'll start stripping it out and you'll be really sad and you don't want to be sad. If you break one of these things, generally you'll have to go in there with like a Torx key or you'll get a Dremel and you'll cut a slit into it and see if you can get them out with a flathead. Get that. I can pull in on the crank access the other one. This upper flipper, the end of stroke switch is good. Um, it looks pretty fresh actually, um, so I think we will not be changing this. The other ones were absolutely shot, which is why we changed the other lower flipper. Come on. There we go. And we're turnage. Remember turnage, that's a technical term. <laughs> oh yeah, get the proper amount of turnage. Get them loose, and we could reach in through the top, and we could twist, 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 twist the flipper until it comes loose from the crank. Oh, you just dropped it. Uh, now we have two five sixteenths head, uh, ten thirty two screws back here, and we will loosen the coil stop. 
The scariest part of putting these flippers back together is absolutely once you've got them reassembled and you go to tighten the coil stop and you run into those stripped out uh, base plates. Right, which is what happened to us last time. Yeah, the other one was really bad. Yeah, also, Arc Mecha, speaking of archive episodes, we did another flipper rebuild on this same Lady Luck game. It didn't have the soldering in the beginning, but it went, was very detailed on how to do the actual flipper rebuild, so please check that out too, that's episode 7. Yeah, I went into a lot more detail on the first one. We'll skip out on a lot of the detail on this one just to kind of show it off one more time. Take the old shaft out. Um, I'm going to use this rag to kind of clean up some of this dust. Makes your fingers all sorts of nasty. I'm going to get a uh, small flathead screwdriver. Actually, I want the bendy one. And this will help me kind of pick this nyliner out. There it goes. It's the, like there's two things that wear on this flipper assembly. These nyliners and the actual nylon bit on the crank. And this one's actually super worn out. Let's show you here. Let me compare it to a new one and you can kind of see. So here's a new one. You've got that nice nylon um, you know, Same follower, thing. right? Nice and Same. circular. Look at this one. <laughs> Goodness. So they, they develop... Oh, but can you pull the the little um, black thing off of it and put it on the new one? I could. What if it it's not super shrunk on. The heat shrink, the insulator. But this right? one, this one's actually pretty badly cracked right here and it's separating. If it wasn't for this rivet, I could probably pull it apart in two pieces. But these things, they wear to where they get a flat spot in them, and that is where you get the free play. The nice thing is, though, is when these things wear, um, they're still pretty powerful, unlike a Williams flipper, where when you start getting a lot of slop in them, they do become weak. Um, I know there's a lot of hatred for these flippers, but I disagree with all of the hate. I think they're super cool. So you're just swapping this out completely. Yeah. <laughs> now I get to do the fun thing where I'm like, wait. Crystal's back. We finally get our crystal jokes. I've been missing that in the last stream. <laughs> she goes, Nyline, er, I hardly know her. Wow. Her delivery would have been much better. Soon we'll have her on the show helping us with camera angles and stuff. And Heckling style. That's what I need is all sorts of heckling. <laughs> okay, so the we're going to replace this coil sleeve. Let's get that out of there. I'm going to get a new nyliner from my pile But of you parts. don't need to worry about replacing the coil because the coils last for a long time, right? Coils really don't go bad because when they're bad, they're like really bad. Um, this coil works. It's fine. Or we're going to keep sleeve. it. Yeah, just the sleeve. Remember with these nyliners, they they have a, a split in them. I like to kind of, you fold them together. On this assembly, you want to make sure that the, the wide end faces the coil. So we'll kind of compress it together and see if I can force it into the hole. Let's see, making it look harder than it should be. Come on. Wow, this one's ornery. Get yeah, it in that hole. Cow has problems with that. What? Right These now? jokes are becoming too personal now. I need to speak to HR. Oh, yeah, that's me. Uh, CNK asked if, can I win a flipper rebuild kit? The linear are so expensive. You know, that would be a really cool giveaway. We should do that. A flipper mm -hmm. rebuild giveaway. We have to think of like a pretty solid competition to get to receive such a amazing prize. Right. Hold on if here. If anyone has any suggestions, please feel free to let me know. And I'll add it to the jacket. Force it in on the side that's not split. 
This one's really fighting with me. There it goes. That is in there, doing its job. We're um, going to change out the nice. flipper bushing because why not? I don't think this flipper bushing is bad. Um, I'll save it and add it to my just-in-case pile if I'm ever working on a customer's game and I don't have one or they want one and they don't want to pay for a new one, whatever. But the flipper bushings are easy to change on these because they just thread straight into the plate, no nuts on the back side like a Williams. Remember, the long side goes up to center the flipper. Make sure the Ooh, holes are so lined up. Beautiful. <laughs> They're so much cleaner. Yeah. <laughs> Look at shiny. I'll set these guys in. But well, since these things are kind of delicate, I do like to find where the thread starts. So I'll turn it left until I feel it kind of chunk in and then start threading. You don't want to cross thread these things because they are like a millimeter and a half thick and uh, there's not a lot of threads to catch on to. There it goes. Get that one in. This one felt a little goofy, so let's... There it goes. Get these nice and tight. We're not talking crazy tight, not, you know, torquing on a wheel tight, but good and tight against the base. All right, so there's that. Now we can um, reassemble. So I'm going to get my crank, I'm going to get my lever, I'm gonna get a stop, a coil sleeve. So now we will reinstall the coil and I do can have enough room it? to turn it around. It. Nice, another small victory. Insert the coil sleeve. And Kyle is turning them around so it doesn't face a coil stop, so the diode is less likely to get damaged from lots of impact. Yeah, right? not, not the most important modification to do if the game is in your home, but, you know, any of my games could end up on location somewhere at any time, so might as well do it right the first time. Let's see here. Got a brand new coil stop. Going to get my 1032 screws. Set that in. Let me get the other one. I'm replacing both of these screws because there was kind of a hodgepodge of hardware holding these flippers together. Um, when we set these flippers back together, again, we want to kind of. Oh, I Ooh. forgot my favorite thing the wavy washer. Oh my gosh. That's a very important thing too. MGM Studios told us why in episode seven. And no, he was. Remember, he was. He was referring to the. Uh, oh right. The, the non-magnetizing bit like of it. this. That thing kind of helps uh, keep the coil under a little bit of tension, so it's not. Right. So it doesn't jiggle. Yeah, free floating. But even though you do have that in there, I do like to start the screws just a couple threads. So we'll get that in here. couple threads so it doesn't fall out get the other one and then what we'll do okay yeah ask who is doing the work that's me uh, yeah I'm not I'm not sure what they're referencing to but yeah that's how Sateri our head tech <laughs> at Marco Pinball head tech and wow our star and the world's tallest pinball streamer currently <sighs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna get like some hate mail or something from Jack. I mean, we're on the same side, man. Maybe I'm the world's tallest pinball tinkerer, tech. Who knows? Just wait till Tom McCullough starts streaming. All the while we're going down. <laughs> so what we need to do now that we have the um, the coil stop screws just kind of started, I like to push on the coil stop to kind of get the, um, you know, get the coil nice and tight between the retaining bracket and the coil stop. And what we'll do is we'll tighten these things down. We're not achieving final torque, but we're kind of influencing the whole assembly to go together um, as tight as possible. So we'll get them snug. And then what I'll do is I'll really push on it and we'll go for our final torque on one side. 
other side. Oh, and those tightened up so nicely. No stripped holes. Yes. Oh, Twitch nature lets you save old VODs. Uh, thanks, APB. We are so we're actually streaming directly to YouTube and Facebook right now as well. So you can access them also via YouTube and Facebook. I personally like archiving on YouTube because I will do a very extensive time code notes list that you might see in the previous episode descriptions. And you'll actually be able to like click on like five minutes and 47 seconds when Kyle, you know, switched to rubber and gave this tip. And, you know, so you don't have to watch the entire hour and a half long. You can kind of scrub through the show notes and be like, oh, this is where I need to go for this part. So hopefully yeah. that helps everyone in the, in the long scheme of things. We're talking about like in 10 years from now. Yeah, to try to get a little bit of a soldering tip. <laughs> an archive going. All right, so I've got enough free play up and down. Remember, you want free play. I don't know if I could get a view of the, if you can see the crank. Let's see. All right. See the crank moving up and down a little bit like that? That means we've got free play. <laughs> Do we have multiple viewers on your end now? That's beautiful. Yeah, a little, well, the, what we, again, the, this is an important adjustment here because if you don't have free play, you'll cause the crank to bind with the nylon flipper sh uh, bushing, and that's not ideal. You want it to be able to have a teeny bit of movement so it doesn't, you know, get, get resistance from the, uh, the flipper bushing. I'm peeking behind the play field here uh, to make sure that this flipper is kind of in a lined up spot. It is. I'm going to rotate it and get this set screw snug. I'm going to let it rest at rest, and I am really going to torque this one down hard. I'm going to find that bit, get it in there nice and snug, hold the assembly and crank. Let's see how much tighter we can get this one. You have to make flipper, or flipper set screws tight. Um, right. You don't want these things coming loose and have floating flippers in your game. That's no fun. I've seen that before on location a few times. It's a it dynamic, happens. it's a feature, dynamic flipper action. <laughs> I think I could get that one a teeny bit more. Oh, right. And if Kyle had his flipper gauge tool with yes. him, we could have seen that in action. Kyle. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I left it. It's and, it's, and if anyone gets a flipper rebuild kit from our website, the flipper gauge tool actually comes with it too. So there's that. Or you can get it on our site for pennies. Yeah, they're super, super cheap. Hundreds of pennies. No, not hundreds. Just just a couple. Maybe. Just a little, little, a modest handful of pennies. You Maybe less than a hundred of pennies. <laughs> so yeah, there you go. You've got another oh, flipper. And uh, a reminder from NGM Studio, he likes to put thread locks on that part to hold it tight. You just have to be careful because sometimes thread lock will mean they'll never come back off. Um, right. blue, blue thread lock is the removable thread lock um, where red okay. stuff is perma, you'll never get them off again. So uh, use, red. You, use, it your, use it your discretion. But yeah, no, we've got a solid coil again. Um, everything's hooked up. We could actually power the game up. Actually, no. Even though we did just replace this and it's new, let's make sure the end of stroke switch has proper action. Um, hope that didn't break. It opens a little early, um, but that's okay. Let me see if I could get a better view of what's going on there. Generally, you want the end of stroke switch to open about an eighth of an inch at the end of the travel, but since this is an upper flipper, um, it's, it's, it's less critical. You just want to make sure that it does open. This upper flipper, um, it's kind of for a, um, a orbit shot, but it's kind of a waste of a flipper. I'm going to talk a little bit of smack on this game. It really doesn't add too much to the gameplay, except for it really makes the ball want to go out the left out lane. So use it your own discretion. But um, as long as this thing opens, it's probably going to have fine action. Um, you'll see when you play the game. But... 
We do have this one opening and closing. Closing. This one <laughs> opens. Let's uh, fire it up and we can see if Kyle did any sort of handiwork. Yay. Let's see if the clippers work. Oh, wait. What? So you did that in 16 minutes and 10 seconds. That's slow. I could yeah. probably get that down to like 10 minutes. <laughs> but it was precise. And I guess very so. And very well explained. So thank you for that. This thing might be real loud. Let's see. And again, thank you, chat, for interacting with each other and helping each other out as you ask questions. That makes my heart feel so warm. <laughs> All right, so we can start a game and we'll fake the game into thinking there's a ball in the out hole. Okay. Oh, you're testing it? With it up and not actually playing a, a game? Yeah. Well, just make sure everything works and everything uh, ends up where they're supposed to be. You can sit and hold these coils on and nothing's burning up. Everything is opening. Uh, we did a pretty okay job. This one still hasn't been touched, the left flipper, but I could probably get that one done in about 10 minutes now. It's my new personal challenge. But uh, yeah, we rebuilt two flippers and they work fine. Awesome. That's so, awesome. I mean, that's it for this show, everyone. We really appreciate you guys hanging out and, and really interacting with Chad. And everyone had such great tips and tricks and helping each other out. That's what it's all about. Um, yeah. Is episode there any... seven and episode eight is Bally Flipper Rebuild. So if you ever need to go back and look at it when you're working on your Bally game, you know where to go. Are there uh, are there any any questions? Have we have we hit our yeah. time limit or? There's no such thing as a time limit here. I mean, uh, do we have any questions? We could. I mean, we could just go and do this one too if we wanted to keep sitting here and talking about flippers. But if there was any other questions or anything anyone wanted to see, um, I, I do know that one of the next things or the next time we visit this game, we will probably be uh, doing drop targets. Um, the Bally drop targets are, I can't get the camera to move the way I want it to. Here, oh, just take it off, why not? The Bally drop targets are very similar throughout like the entire lifetime of Bally games. So these uh, Lady Luck drop targets are going to be basically the same as some of your older games, like back to the mid 70s. So that'll be fun. Um, they're really oh, easy. So will we do that next week? Uh, yeah. It depends on if we have the parts. So we have them coming, but we'll find out soon. Uh, next week, we, we, could, we could do some top-end stuff on this game. Um, we could roll on to another game. Um, there's always something to do. Means, yeah. Everything here needs love. Um, I don't know. What should we do next week? What do you think? Should Anyone have any ideas for what you would like to see next week? Uh, say it in the chat now while we're still live, or send us an email to marcotv at marcopinball.com, and we have happy to show you. We have lots of games here in our studio, all sorts of eras, from know, EMs to solid state. I posted to on the uh, pinball Andy. subreddit, and uh, a lot of those people wanted to see some electromechanical work. Um, while I, I know everyone's like EM, EM, EM. Is that what the chat's saying too? Great. Um, I, I can work on EMs. I'm, I'm, I'm okay at it and I can, I, I can do it, but I'm not super efficient at like troubleshooting some of the, uh, you know, more deep logic level stuff. Um, I'll poke around. I know I have a Jack in the box over there that has a really lazy, uh, it's not scoring 50 points well. So that's either we have a dirty switch on the motor, something goofy is going on with the 50 point relay or the 10 point relay is being lazy. So, uh, or the score reel, I guess, the end of stroke switch could be goofy. We could look at that. Uh, EM stuff is a little more methodical for me. So it's harder to set up and be like, okay, yeah, this is what we need to do. Um, I was working right. on my Grand Prix a couple weeks ago trying to get the thing to fully reset and I feel like I was spending about 45 minutes banging my head against the wall trying to read the schematic. <laughs> um, Here's a few things. Um, well, 
Pinball Princess Jillian says she gets the most views when she's on her EMs. And I'm actually, I've been doing this EM repair group led, who leads that one like off site? It's like a Zoom conference call. Uh, Mark, Mark Gibson and uh, Nick Schnell. And then uh, and David. my friend David is also giving great advice in that. It's, it's really awesome. They're very smart I'll people. Put, I'll put a link of that in our show notes too. That's a really cool setup they have because if you have a specific EM with a problem, you sign up for that seminar with that in mind and you have your camera and everything ready. And when it's your turn, then you show them what the issue is. And then these guys are brilliant and they just sit there and help you solve your problem right there. So I've yeah. been tuning in and watching that too. And just trying to learn. Running through the schematics. It's super great. intimidating too. Everything about uh, I think it might be fun to me, do, so. um, it might be fun to like rip apart a Gottlieb score uh, reel. Yeah. A drum we have unit. A, a, we have a few other suggestions. CNK saying something about, I know Colorado pinball needs help with a lock bar. Uh, what any, all, all the ways to adjust lock bars. Huh. Okay. So like some practical operator type stuff. Is yeah. That I mean, I guess sometimes those things can be a little tight. Let me know what's going on with the lock bar. Um, it's yeah, easier for me to help fix something when I know what's wrong. Um, the, the, that's good. I know my, uh, yeah. my good friend Kale wanted me to, uh, show how to adjust a Williams shooter rod housing. That's a pretty handy thing because there are oh, yeah. lots of space where you could get those things to jiggle around. Maybe we could uh, bust open my Twilight Zone and do a little bit of maintenance on Twilight Zone. Um, Theirs is loose. Loose? Says. What game is it? The lock bar is loose. What game is it? And um, while he responds, uh, I, I think I'd Catalan like to do Sky said they're trying to get their Stern MPU 200 board working. <laughs> No, 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 no. <laughs> the dogs are here. The <laughs> one of my one of the other big re uh, requests I got on that Reddit post was, um, okay, I have a pinball game, and the lights turn on, but nothing else happens. Where do I go? And I would really, really like to do that. I was thinking that might be a fun serialized show where we just take a Bally game or a Stern game. And um, I kind of roll through the motions of figuring out what's going on. Um, if, you know, with the MPU 200s and those old Bally and Stern boards, a lot of that's condition dependent. Um, I love original hardware being Mr. Original stuff, but sometimes those things just aren't worth your time to save. It's really sad, especially when you've got the Alltech computers <laughs> and the... Um, you know, the, what, what's his face, NVRAM Weebly's computers, you know, they're just wonderful. And if you value your time at X dollars an hour, it just makes more sense to replace them a lot of the time. But, you know, you need to, for a Bally computer to boot, I think you need five volts, 12 volts, and the 40 volts also runs to the computer. Uh, maybe you don't need the 12 volts. I need to look at the schematic, but I do know that you need those two voltages at least. So a uh, pin wiki, um, has a really good um, setup on how to, you know, diagnose your computer. But I would absolutely love to do that. I have a friend that has a few old Bally games that don't work, and we'll just take one out of the junk pile and see what we can do with it. That sounds fun. Nice. And Indie Pin suggests that at some point an interactive Q and A would be good. I think that would be a lot of fun. Absolutely. Uh, we, we've been talking about doing actual call-ins. So you could call in through our, our Zoom chat or something like that and actually talk on air with us about yeah. stuff. I, I think uh, that would be good. We were, work. We've been doing um, what we've been calling like the Marco after hours. And sometimes it's just, just sitting down and talking pinball and goofing off. Or a couple days ago, we were just streaming, playing a game. But it would be fun to have people I join can. in on those things. And I'd love to sit and drink a beer and give you some advice at the best I can, at least. Oh, uh, Jay Bovinci says you could show how to repin connectors for solid states. Yeah, yeah, no, that's really important. Um, that's a great idea. I'd like to do right. that. Um, I'm like, I'm. By the way, I'm copying all of these down. 
for later. No, that's great. Yeah, no, let's do that. Um, I always try to explain to customers, I see a lot of customers buying the IDC, the insulation displacement connectors, and I really don't like those things. They're not great. And I'm always trying to convince people, it's like all you need is a wire cutter and the uh, a trusty handy dandy Molex wire crimper. This is the best tool in your pinball mm -hmm. toolbox. Everyone needs one. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, let's do that. Maybe next week, even if we're not doing it on a game, let's just sit down and pin a few connectors. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's let's... that's a great suggestion. Oh, okay. CNK is going to send their tech to watch the show next Thursday. All right. I believe, and, and we can talk about that. So, yeah, that's awesome. Um, Oh, here's another good one. Um... I just lost it. Making Gottlieb System 1 games free play? <laughs> uh, That's a joke? Is that a joke? No, I fire. don't. <laughs> I don't like Gottlieb <laughs> System know. 1 anything. Um, oh, but okay. I, I need, that's like, that's probably my weakest um, area is those, is the System 1 stuff. I've never owned a System 1 game and I don't get the opportunity to work on them very often. I'll look into that. I think I mean, the way you trick an old Bally game is you set the replay to be as low as possible. So generally 10,000 points. I think you do something on the System 1s mm -hmm. that way also. That's what I do on all my System 80 games. Um, I'll, I'll look into that. I do know that if you are running, like, um, I, I think the, uh, what are they called? That, that French guy, uh, is it Pascal? He made those uh, aftermarket computers and then the... Uh, Neewumpf. I think the Neewumpf boards have an ability to put things on free play, but uh, I, I'm not 100% certain. Yeah, CNK said the new System 1 board has free play, possibly. If you're running a System 1 game with its original hardware, that's really awesome. <laughs> so if you are, email me and I'll try to figure it out for you um, because oh, that's really cool. Possibly a door wire trick. Yeah, I mean, sometimes people will wire up their credit button to hit the coin switch first. So you'll put a coin switch in behind the start button. So you'll push the button and it'll add a credit and then start the game. That's one way you can do it. Oh, okay. I like to get it in the software if I can. Oh, um, okay. well, yeah, I don't know. I'll have to look into that. Oh, the the um, lock bar too he was talking about, it shifts or rocks while it's playing. It's like a newer game, possibly an Iron Man. I've seen that before where it's just kind of jiggles. Yeah, I've seen the I've seen the little arms that get latched in get bent. Um, huh? Yeah, that they, those kinds of things are hard unless you're really close and looking at them. Sometimes the old Gottliebs they have push nuts, and you could uh, take the end. I was thinking if it was a push nut cap or something, you could take the old push nuts off, put new ones on, and really slam them down, and that tightens them up. But um, yeah, that that wouldn't be harder to see without looking at it. Yeah. Well. Cool. That's all awesome, awesome suggestions, everyone. And yeah. I wrote, I wrote them all down, and we will eventually get to all of them. Remember, we are streaming live every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And if for whatever reason that can't happen, we'll update you with the time. You know, we might go into a more prime time eventually, maybe like a 7 or 8 p.m. Eastern on a Thursday. Let me know what y'all think about that. Been We've late. been playing around with the idea. We also have another, some more other show ideas coming up too, besides the Marco After Hours thing. If you guys want to hang out with us and play pinball on the Marco After Hours, just shoot me a PM on the Facebook page, on Marco's Specialty Facebook page. And our other shows, I don't want to reveal what we're doing yet, but we are working on a few different concepts. So it's going to be really fun. Excited. It's going to be fun and dorky and informative. And I think those are my favorite All things. All about so. pinball. Yeah, when, would you think we should, when should we stream pinball again? Should we try to make that like a set day maybe? Do you think we After should try hours? to do it again on Thursday? Or Tuesday, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It'd be fun pretty, to get some people to join day in. For that. Yeah. But until then, thank you everybody so much. Thanks, Jonas Cope and everyone else. Everyone that was participating and helping each other in the chat. That was absolutely beautiful. And we really appreciate it. And until next week, stay safe out there. Bye. Bye.